Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Craig Merriweather. Welcome, Craig. I'm so happy to have Hi, you. Hi, Don. Yeah, we've uh, been uh, looking forward to this, uh, both of us. We've been going back and forth for a, a while just with our schedules. And so yes. it's finally here, and I'm excited to be talking with you. I'm excited to talk to you too. So we're going to be talking about basically past life regression, yeah. but I would like to do some myth busting okay. about hypnosis. And um, so you're a hypnotherapist, but then also a neuro linguistic programmer. Is that like um, subliminal messages? Is that like when you try and tell people uh, to quit smoking and stuff? And Sort of, kind of, not really. Uh, the, <laughs> basically, the the theories around neuro linguistic programming were developed by Richard Bandler and John Grinder. And they were two academics at the University of Santa Cruz, University of California at Santa Cruz back in the early 70s, uh, and I forget who was who, but one was a linguist and one was a mathematician. And they were having these discussions about the language of healing. Because at the time, there was a really famous, well, a few famous people who were able to just to talk to somebody and have them heal emotional problems, uh, mental mindset issues, beliefs about themselves, even physical issues. And they were fascinated this. Bandler and Grinder were fascinated by this. And so they started researching it at an academic level. And they were looking at words. They were looking at word placement. They were looking at sentence formation. They were looking at tonality. They were looking at rhythm. And they're looking at all these people who are using language in healing. And they codified it, kind of created a protocol system around it. And they decided to name it Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP. And so that was the 70s. In the 80s, one of the People who started promoting neurolinguistic programming as a tool for the common person to help deal with phobias and fears and uh, mindset issues, beliefs, belief issues, even emotional issues was Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins started bringing that to the rest of us in a way we could understand, in a way we could use it. That's how Tony Robbins got famous. I did not and know that. But after that, then it started becoming as people understood the power and influence of language, which they already did. But as more and more people started understanding it, it started being used in sales seminars uh, for used car salesmen. And mm -hmm. and then the uh, pickup industry got into it. Um, you know, uh, picking up women in bars kind of industry started using it as well, using the language of influence. And it's not that it's it's sort of like the force in Star Wars. <laughs> it's neither good nor bad. It's how you, your intention in using it. It's like a hammer. You can build a beautiful cathedral. You can destroy a building with a hammer. The hammer is neither good or bad. It's your intention and how you use it. Same with the force in Star Wars and the same with neuro-linguistic program. You can use it for healing or you can use it to manipulate somebody to their will. A big part of that, though, is uh, your intention as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of like that uh, great quote from Anchorman. If if you and your your listeners know the movie Anchorman uh, with uh, Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd, there's a great quote by Paul Rudd, and he says, "60 percent of the time, it works every time." <laughs> and that's sort of like neuro linguistic programming. It works every time unless it doesn't. Yeah. But it's the idea about language where they've done multiple studies over the years. And one study was back in the day when you're uh, going to college, you're at the university, you used to have to take books and make photocopies. There wasn't the internet. And if you wanted to study at home, you couldn't, some of these books you couldn't check out because everybody needed to use them. And so you'd have to line up at the photocopier, take your dimes and your nickels and your quarters and photocopy the parts of the book you needed. Well, there'd be these long lines of people because back then the photocopier was $50,000. And so the library can only afford one or two. So there'd be long lines, especially during finals and as reports are due. And so the sociologists uh, would sometimes do these experiments on, you know, how to get to the front of the line. What language can be used to get to the front of the line? And what they found is by adding the word because, you can influence people to do what you'd like them to do. So they'd come up to the front of the line and say, hey, would it be okay if I cut in front of you and make my copies because my grandmother just went into the hospital, because my mother is sick, because I have yeah. to get to work, otherwise I'm going to lose my apartment. It got, got to the point where they could say, can I cut in line because I need to make copies? And people would let them do it. Again, it's that anchorman thing, 60% of the time it worked every time. 
but they would also go into like bars, a crowded bar on a Friday night. The the bar itself with all the stools are taken and people would go up to, you know, men, women and say, hey, can I have your seat because I've worked a really long day today? And again, it got to the point where they could say, uh, can I have your seat because I'd like to sit down? And a lot of the, the majority of the time people would. Oh, that's so funny. Their seat. Uh, police officers will use it when arresting people and they'll say, I need you to turn around and calm down because I need to put these cuffs on you. So the word because helps create compliance. And so with in the use of healing hypnosis, you can use it. It's like, I'd like you to relax more and more now because you're going to fix this issue completely and permanently here today. And so I was like, oh, okay. And so it's <laughs> a way of using this language to get people to heal themselves. So you think that your perceptions of your world and your universe are created by you and they are not right. They're created by outside influence. And so in terms of, you know, neuro-linguistic programming, yes, it's a kind of was set up as a way to study the language of healing, though it's kind of been used in certain circles to help manipulate, not only with just commercials, but maybe influencing people to politically uh, and, and, you know, with the news and all this kind of stuff, but you really have to be aware of your environment of what's happening in the world around you, especially when you start noticing it with the news or politicians or commercials, how are they manipulating you? Mm -hmm. Commercials really, I mean, even with movies or a TV show, uh, that's why they add the music to a movie. The music is helping influence your emotions about a scene. That's why, you know, if you just watch uh, a sad movie without the music, it doesn't work. Right. But you have the big swelling music and all of a sudden you're in tears. Yeah. Even though, you know, the the actor didn't die. You saw them on the, you know, on the late night talk show. Right. <laughs> they're still alive, but you see them die in this movie. You're like, oh, so sad. Yeah. It's like, well, because you're being manipulated through your emotions. And so where else is that happening in your life? Yeah. But in terms of therapeutic hypnosis, we use what's already happening in your life in terms of how you're being influenced, but we're doing it on purpose. Uh, Dr. Irving Kirsch calls hypnotherapy a non-deceptive placebo. And if any research study, let's say a pharmaceutical company is doing research on a, a, a new drug for high blood pressure, and they're developing this new high blood pressure medication, if they want their research published in a peer-reviewed medical or scientific journal, they have to have that control group. They have to have half the group take a sugar pill because they know mind will heal the body. They know you can heal the body. And so half the people are being tricked into healing themselves. And so what hypnotherapy is about, why Dr. Kirst calls a non-deceptive placebo is that we're going to use mind, your mind to heal you. We're just going to do it on purpose without tricking you into doing it. Gosh, you that's know? so interesting. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about the movies and stuff, like the media, uh, what we see um, has formed our beliefs in what we think hypnotherapy is, being hypnotized, mm -hmm. what it is. So yeah. Um, I love busting myths. And so I printed off some things, some myths, and I want yeah. you to tell yeah. me what you think about Let's the myths. Go. I'm okay. Ready. okay. Hypnosis means losing control. The exact opposite, because you're not losing control. You're already out of control. That's why you're seeing a hypnotherapist, whether it's grabbing a <laughs> cigarette because you're stressed and you're inhaling cancerous chemicals into your lungs, whether you're, you have a negative mindset and constantly telling yourself that you're not worthy, that you have, you don't matter in life, that you have these wounds that may have been created 50 years ago that still hurt. You're already out of control. You're already hypnotized to a certain extent. You know, we know those people who... Uh, are the calmest, most joyful, wonderful, compassionate people, yet you get them behind the wheel of a car on a freeway and they become the most enraged people you've ever seen. That's but me. Stop their blinker on now. They're going to, oh, you're going to tailgate me. We'll see how that's going to yeah. work. My God. Who that's me. Switched your personality. So is that in control or out of control? Right, if right. Somebody is in that situation has hypnotized them when put in a certain environment, a certain situation behind the wheel of a car going 80 miles an hour to change personality and become angry and enraged, mm -hmm. maybe even hateful. 
And and yet when they get out of the car, oh, they're most loving, wonderful person. <laughs> that is odd. That is strange. That is out of control. Right. So what hypnotherapy helps you do is get you back in control because the big myth about this is I I can't control anybody, nor can I fix anybody. I don't fix anybody. And hypnotherapy in of, of itself doesn't fix you. You fix yourself. It's a non-deceptive placebo. Your mind is going to fix all this because who better to know what the problem is? Right. Now, this is talk therapy. We're not going to go on and on and on. And, and granted, and not, this isn't to throw talk therapists under the bus or anything, but I think a lot of people go to talk therapy. They're hurting. They're in pain. They want to fix something in their life. They don't know what it is. So they seek somebody else out to tell them what their problem is and how to fix it. That's why it takes months just to even get to maybe what the real problem may be. And more than likely, that's not the real problem. That's just a... a side effect or a subset of the problem. The core issue is hidden so far within the unconscious mind. How long is it going to take to dig that out? But you know what the problem is because that's why you're trying to protect yourself, arm yourself with this anxiety or this anger or this, or just feeling that hurt and pain. You know why you're doing it because that issue is within the unconscious, not conscious, that the unconscious and the unconscious mind is running, is, is creating 95% of mind according to neuroscience. Conscious mind only makes up 5% of mind. So using the conscious mind to kind of heal these hidden issues with therapeutic hypnosis, we bypass that conscious level of mind just by relaxing the body and mind a little bit. And sometimes it's just as easy to ask, you know, where does this pain come from? The pain you feel in your heart, the pain you feel in your gut, the pain you feel in the back of your neck or your low back or, or your head. Link it back to the memory or the thought that's creating it. Oh, it's this. Because you know what it is. Right, right. You know, unconsciously. But that's why we use the unconscious mind to do this work. And so in terms of control, it's not losing control. It's giving you back control. I can't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. That's why smoking sensation isn't 100% guarantee. Because if the person doesn't want to quit smoking, they're not going to quit smoking. Right, there's free will I, in there. Yeah. I can't go to, you know, because there's spouses who say, okay, you're quitting smoking. I've had it with the expense. I've had it with the smell. I've had it with riding in your car. You're done with smoking. Well, that person's not going to go going to quit smoking if they don't want to. I can't go into Las Vegas casinos and, and bars and things and just snappy, snappy, wavy, wavy, make everybody quit smoking. Yeah. I can't go into prisons and turn it, you know, hypnotize everybody to be, uh, you know, upstanding law abiding citizens. I can't go to the leaders of the world and create world peace. Right. I can't get Elon Musk to write me a billion dollar check. Why? Because he doesn't want to. Jerry. So I can't hypnotize Elon Musk to write me a billion dollar check. That's why I don't have one. And so, it's about your intention. And a lot of people in terms of the, the control things come from that sh the, the shows that you see in Las Vegas mm -hmm. or maybe comedy club, maybe videos you've seen on YouTube. Well, I'm not going to make you quack like a duck. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. That's the weirdest thing that people tell me. Well, you all quack like a duck. Why? Why would I yeah. want to? That's yeah. Odd. Well, that's what we see. My big thrill in life is making people quack like chickens. But in terms of those shows, and that what gets a lot of people is like, well, they get up and, and they dance like Michael Jackson, they sing like Elvis Presley, and they bark yeah. like dogs, they pretend they're on roller coasters, it's like, because they want to. Every single person volunteered to be up on that stage. And especially those Las Vegas shows, they're like 70, 80 bucks. Yeah. And so this hypno hypnotist comes out, yeah, they, they have to put on a good show. And so who are they going to pick? People who don't want to go into hypnosis? People who are you know, sitting there like this, well, you're not going to make me do anything. Great. Just enjoy the show because there's at least 30 other people who are jumping up and down, waving their arms. Please pick me, pick me, pick me because they want to. Right. That's not what I want to do with my life. Probably not what you, Don, want to do with your life or your listeners. But there are people out there who are, are extroverts. They're exhibitionists. They want to entertain. They want to go up there and have a fun time. They want to have a silly video to put on TikTok or Instagram. They want to have look silly in front of their friends. They just want be to be seen. Have a time. Yeah. They want to be seen and they want to put themselves out there. One of the things they'll do is they'll do some testing to make sure they're a good candidate. Again, this person has to provide an entertaining show for everybody's mm -hmm. 80 bucks. And so they'll do a little, uh, little exercise and techniques like, okay, everybody up on the stage, I want you to close your eyes and pretend you, you put your hands together in the prayer position and pretend your hands are super glued together and you cannot pull them apart. Try, just try to pull them apart. And everybody's like, Ugh, uh, do yeah. this. and that one person will, do that, will break them apart. They're off the stage. They're not going to be a good candidate. If they're not mm -hmm. following the instruction with a simple little thing, like pretend your hands are glued together. Right. Again, if they're trying to trick the hypnotist or uh, 
prove that they can't be hypnotized, great. Don't be hypnotized. Go back to your seat. Mm -hmm. So everybody up on that stage, they're not being controlled. They're allowing themselves to have a really fun time. Assuming that they're actually in some sort of trancey state, uh, they're doing it because they want to. Mm -hmm. It's their intention to have fun and, and entertain and, and, and be silly. And so what if your intention is to heal? What, what are the possibilities that you're going to do it? Knowing that even though you are unaware of the deeper core issue, you know what it is because mm -hmm. it's within your unconscious mind. You're trying to protect yourself from it. And so you know what the problem is. You know, we, we hold on to like a pin very tightly with our fist sometimes. And after a while, we, we hold on to a pin so tight with our fist that it starts feeling familiar to us. And then it's so familiar that it starts, you know, feeling comfortable, comfortably miserable, but we're still comfortable because it's so familiar. And then after a while, it's so familiar, so comfortable, we start thinking that this is who we are. It's not, though. Just drop the pin and walk away. Just right. drop it and let it go. Yeah. And you're allowed to do that. And just as instantaneously as that trauma was installed, let's say if somebody was a little kid and they grew up in a very unsafe home, just as instantaneously as a trauma can be installed, why wouldn't you be able to heal it instantaneously? Who told you that you couldn't? And what is it to their benefit that you don't heal quickly? Mm -hmm. you know, right. That's why hypotherapy takes, generally what I tell people is the average is three, four sessions. Some people I see one time, some people I see eight times. I don't, you know, it depends on what they want to work on and, and the kind of work they want to do. But this isn't talk therapy where we may be seeing each other 80, 90, 100 sessions over two mm -hmm. years and you're still in, in pain right. afterwards because, because you're not working on the core issue. You're working on subset issues and side effect issues, mm -hmm. which is fine. It's good. I mean, I always need a coach. It's important to have that. But in terms of this deeper healing, you're allowed to do it yourself. So in reality, you know, it's like it's taking away control, but isn't that what you're doing with talk therapy? Right. You're seeking somebody else's advice outside of yourself to tell you what to do and how to heal something, tell you what your problem is. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not to throw talk therapists under the bus or put them on blast, but it's, it's uh, oftentimes I get the sense that people go to talk therapy. They don't know what the problem is. They don't know why they have this anxiety. They don't know why they hurt and they're in pain. So they go to somebody else to tell them what their problem is and how to deal with it. Isn't that losing control? Right. You go to a hypnotherapist. I don't know what your problem is. You do though. So that sounds like a lot of heavy lifting to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to work hard. Right. You know, so why not just have you fix it? The person who's holding on to the hurt and pain and just have you have you drop it. And so that was that was a really long answer to maybe what a, a short question. Yeah. But in terms of control is like this is the exact opposite. We give you back control. It's not so much hypnotizing you as dehypnotizing you from the hurt and pain you've been holding on to quite possibly for decades. Right, right. You touched on a couple of the things while you were talking um, about like hypnosis makes you reveal secrets. You know, that's more the out of control stuff. Um, I did want to read this because we are going to talk about past life regression. We're going to get to it. People yeah. that are listening and waiting for that because we're like half an hour in already. I know. <laughs> um, but the myth <laughs> is path life, past life regression is proven and scientific. The truth, past life regression is widely used in hypnotherapy, but its basis remains speculative and largely unproven. Many psychologists suggest it may be a form of guided imagery or the mind's way of processing unresolved issues through storytelling rather than actual memories from previous lives. Yeah. What do you have yeah. to say about that? That may actually be true. I can't prove either way. When somebody has an experience with a, a past life regression, what's important for me when I do this work is the healing the person is looking for in this current life. That's what this work is all about. Mm -hmm. It's the healing in this life. While uh, and and there's issues around just wanting to discover past um, experiences you may have or how they influenced you positively. But a lot of times people come to me because their intuition is telling them that the issue they're having, the anxiety, the anger, the the fear around maybe, you know, fear of men or the fear of authority figures or something is related to something not in this life because they've done the work. They've done the, um, you know, talk therapy and the other processes and they still hurt. So what could be relate, related to and their intuition is telling them. Well, maybe it's a past life. I read that Brian Weiss book, Many Lives, Many Masters, or Michael Newton's Journey of Souls or whatever. And, and that's what's interesting about this work 
Yeah, that, that's a great theory that the subconscious mind is creating uh, symbolism and storytelling and mythology to help you heal. Great. Let's do the healing work. Again, we could spend three or four hours over a cup of coffee d- deciding whether it's one way or the other and never get to an answer. Mm-hmm. But the, the the evidence and the research and the research out there uh, showing that there are mechanisms within the brain that seem to connect to what is known as zero point field or the field, or again, like in Star Wars, the force. If you were to take an atom the atom that makes up me, that makes up you, Dom, makes up the, the desk, the chair, the whatever. If you take an atom and you just start looking at an electron microscope and going further and further into an atom, okay, here's the electrons and the, the uh, neutrons and here's the quarks and here's the subatomic particles. The very essence of what makes up an atom, makes up a, a molecule, is this vibrational field that binds the universe together. And they call it zero point field because if you take that uh atom, that molecule, all the way down to zero to freezing, it still vibrates. It should be stopped, but it, the vibration still is moving. And so this energy force that binds all things together. Well, one research study indicated that that's where memory and knowledge is held. Memory and knowledge is not held within the brain, but it's held within zero point field. And the brain is a receiver and transmitter of this information. Well, that seems kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> and yet there's uh, other other research that is indicates that the pineal gland it works as by applying pressure to the pineal gland it creates an electromagnetic field a measurable electromagnetic field and how do you apply pressure to this it's a right sized piece of the brain its main task is melatonin production but the research has shown by applying pressure by by moving the uh, uh, um, cerebral fluid within your brain through breathing techniques you apply pressure to the pineal gland. Why that's important is that your pineal gland is filled with tiny little crystals. And I'll, I'll send you a, a link to uh, the pictures so you can actually see these um, from electron microscope. Because I mean, it's, the pineal gland is about the size of a grain of rice. There's millions of these crystals. And the reason why crystals are in your phone or in all the electronic gear in your watch, in your TV, is because it can conduct electricity. Crystals conduct electricity, and some crystals, when pressure is applied, create its own magnetic field and like uh, electromagnetic field. That's what this research is saying, is that the pineal gland is a transducer, and it's bringing in information through frequency or energy or vibrator, whatever, and turning it back into image and sound. And so in terms of accessing past life uh, information, the mechanism to accessing that information, or even it goes to maybe psychics or channeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is how this can happen. If if anybody out there knows about uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've read his he book. He that breathing technique where it comes mm-hmm. from the root chakra up your spinal cord. He does like, and you know, hold it. What he's doing is, is uh, that technique is turning the uh, cerebral flume around the pineal gland. That's why he does that breathing technique, mm-hmm. the dispense breathing technique, is specifically moving energy from your kind of um, root chakra up the spinal cord into your brain. So it starts uh, circulating the cerebral fluid. So you start p- applying pressure to your pineal gland. Mm-hmm. Why that is. And so there's tons of research to show that we are set up to gain that information. We we're probably doing it anyway. When we want to remember that vacation we took 10 years ago or the lunch we had last week or you know that two plus two equals four, it's not in the brain. We're pulling it from somewhere else. And so with past life regression, I can't prove one way or another where that's really your past life. That's somebody else's life you're tuning into to help healing or it's a metaphor and symbolism your subconscious mind is creating for the healing. I, I can't prove either way. So when I do this work, what is most important is the healing that you're looking to achieve. But I've had enough anecdotal evidence to suggest something is going on. Mm-hmm. And maybe even if 10, 20%, maybe 90% is all uh, metaphors the subconscious mind is creating to heal. What about that other 10%? Something's mm-hmm. happening. And so it's really about the healing and why that's important to me is that when I was doing my training, I trained uh, at the Hypnotherapy Academy of America, which is a real school, 500 hours 
And it's 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday for two and a half months. This is some weekend course, and then you can call yourself a hypnotherapist. A lot of it was taught by two physicians, uh, Dr. Robert Sapien, who's an emergency pediatric physician at the hospital in Albuquerque, where the school is, teaches at the university there, University of New Mexico, as well as Dr. Dulce, who's a nurse, neurosurgeon, literally one of the teachers at, at the hypnotherapy academy is a brain surgeon, and how they use hypnosis in terms of healing and pain control and things like this. Well, the last two weeks is past life regression, spirit world regression, that, that kind of thing. So basically, a, a, a hundred hours of, of a, after all the other, all the clinical hypnosis, the medical hypnosis, then we go into the more spiritual, more esoteric side of things. And another hundred hours just on that. When I do that work, if there's nothing specific to heal, maybe you want some insights about life or to meet your greatest spiritual teacher or... Maybe you you have a gift, a talent, like a, a musical instrument or or martial arts or something. There's a theory that uh, an extraordinary musician, let's say Yo-Yo Ma, considered one of the greatest cello players of all time, it took multiple lives to get to that mastery. You know, Bruce Lee, uh, considered one of the great martial art uh, uh, martial arts practitioners, uh, took multiple lives for him to get to that level of, of mastery. So, you know, if you have a great talent, maybe let's see some past lives that. Mm -hmm. So, and there's no specific healing, but a lot of people come to this work because of the hurt and pain they're in. And so let's heal the hurt and pain. Mm -hmm. Again, again, kind of a, a long answer to a short question, but in terms of the past life, there seems to be mechanisms that have been set up within our brain that allow us to receive this information. Now, whether again, it's yours, it's somebody else's you're tapping into for healing for whatever reason, again, there's a whole nother three hour conversation, uh, you know, healing, helping heal your soul group, your soul friends, people you move through various lives with playing various roles to help learn and grow and develop. If mm -hmm. somebody got in trouble, are you here to help them heal this? You know, it, it gets a little mind twisty, but whether it's yours or somebody else's, or it's just a metaphor, your subconscious mind is creating, it's about the healing. Right. You know, that's right. the most important, you know, and it, this isn't when the way I do past life, you're not paying me for me to tell you what your past lives were. I, do, I just, that, that rubs me the wrong way. Experience it yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how powerful would that be? Right. Not only knowing that you can do it, but just having that experience. And again, the, the, the thing with, yeah, there's people out there who say that it's just made up and, and a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, is it real? Is it not real? I don't know. A typical past life regression, we block off about three hours. The first, and then we'll have some communication beforehand, whether a phone call or some emails back and forth. And I'll give you tons of information uh, to set yourself up to have an extraordinary experience. But we'll talk a little bit, you know, about, okay, specifically, what do you want to work on? We'll do a warm up exercise, talk a little bit, kind of like what I said about the brain and, and show images of the crystals. And this is how this is going to work. Take a little bit of a bathroom break. And this is, whether this is Zoom, like we're doing like right now or over, over, um, uh, or in person, uh, we'll take a little bit of break, bathroom break, because we can make two, two and a half hours, two hours, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. And so like a, like a, lo a long car journey, do you have to go to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. And so we'll take a bigger bit of a break and then we'll do this process. And, and so we have lots of time, not only to go through the past life and find certain aspects, certain, um, events or situations or circumstances in that life that have to do with what you need to heal, whether it's the hurt or the pain, the anxiety, or the fear of deep water, even though you live in the mountains or whatever it may be, and then move up into spirit world and gain all this information of not only, you know, the group you may be moving through these lives with your soul group or connecting with your guide, but also about why this life and why now, why this current life, uh, purpose, ultimate goals, mission. What do you need to be doing differently? Or is everything just working out the way it's supposed to? And so we have this big uh, you know, bullet points of questions to get through. And But one aspect of it is the healing. This is where the healing happens up in spirit world. And so we go to the healing space. And that may look differently for people. Some people it's light, some people it's energy, some people it's water. Some people it looks like a, you know, a garden. Other people it looks like more futuristic, or maybe it's just mist of a of certain color or energy or whatever. It is. And that's where the kind of that metaphor comes in of the subconscious. Mm -hmm. But they all go to a healing place. And one aspect of that is just pulling out the cords of influence that are negative. Pull out those, and I want you to reach in and grab that cord and pull it out like you're pulling out the you know, the toaster plug from the wall, pull this out. So I'm working with this, uh, a person 
And uh, we get to that point. I was like, pull out the cords. And if you need help, if they're too big, if they're in there too much, ask for help. Whether there's healing beings there with you or your mm -hmm. guide, maybe your friends are there. I don't know. You know, ask for help. And so there's long stretches of silence during this work. I'm asking a lot of questions that people are responding to me because not only we want a recording of this, so you can refer to it later, you know, six months from later, two years later. We want to want to uh, have a recording. So I'm asking lots of questions and people are responding to me, even in their trance state about what they're experiencing. So I can help facilitate healing and ask certain questions about what they're experiencing and help them move forward. Uh, this door seems to be locked. Well, unlock it then with your mind and go walk through the, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. people and so we're at the healing place and that that's a time to just be quiet and allow them to do the healing, doing some encouraging uh, phrases while, while they're there. And it's taken a bit of time, which is fine. Take the time you need. That's why these things are three hours. And of, you know, one of the things is when you're done, say I'm complete or nod your head or whatever the cue is. So I know to continue on. And a couple of days later, I check up with people. How are you doing? What are, what are some cool insights you've, you've come to since our work together? And so when people say, is it, is it a metaphor? Is it really happening? It's like, I don't know, but you're seeing results. Yeah, that's amazing. You know? Yeah, not not just emotional uh, and even mindset issues, you know, beliefs about yourself or your world, but there's physical issues that, that are getting healed. Right. Again, whether that's the extraordinary power of your subconscious mind to heal, to take back control, or this is happening within the spirit realm. I can't prove one way or the other, but just the anecdotal evidence and even the literal scientific evidence seems to suggest there's something happening there. Right. Yeah. The there mind is just health. amazing. It's just yeah. crazy. Well, if people wanted to get your services, how can they find you? Where would they reach out? Well, I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, although I'd probably say 80, 85% of my work is done over Zoom mm -hmm. nowadays, like a lot of people, and it works really well over Zoom. Uh, and it, and the, again, even research is showing that Zoom sessions, whether it's talk therapy or therapeutic hypnosis or a doctor's appointment or something like that, Zoom sessions work as well as in person. And there's actually been studies that show Zoom sessions work better than in person because people feel relaxed and comfortable in their homes. Sure. Uh, they feel safe in their homes. And if you you know, kind of live in a big city or even a small city, you don't have to drive across town on a Friday afternoon and rush hour traffic to try to get your appointment on time. Right. But people feel comfortable. So it works well over Zoom. So most of my stuff's over Zoom in the last years. And uh, I, but I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. And so the name of my practice, I named it Arizona Integrative Hypnotherapy. Okay. And so if you just, I know that's a, a mouthful and a, a lot to remember, but if you just went to, if you just Googled Flagstaff hypnosis, you'll find Arizona integrated hypnotherapy. If you want more information about the more spiritual side of this work, because I've kind of branded that as the more clinical side of trauma and, and pain mm -hmm. control and, and working with cancer patients and things like that. The more spiritual spiritual side of this, uh, I have a website called Divinus Arcana, which again is like a mouthful and I'm not very <laughs> good at, at coming up with easy to remember names. It's okay. Yeah. But um, Divinus Arcana, which is um, sacred mystery in Latin, uh, but that that talks more and more about the past life and spirit world regression kind of stuff. And and uh, the probably the easiest one to remember, I have a test anxiety course you know, for whether you're a high school student taking the SATs or you're a professional and you need to take a licensing or certification exam to uh, start uh, your career, whether you're a lawyer or a real estate agent or electrician or somebody, it's called ACE Any Test. And that's the easiest one to remember. And you can just <laughs> email me from any one of those. And even if it's ACE Any Test, just say, hey, I'm interested in past life regression. I'm like, oh, okay, good. Let's talk about that. Right, right. Yeah. How fascinating to be able to yeah. delve into all different kinds of topics like that. That's just, yeah. I can't imagine how interesting your job is, but yeah, thank you make, so makes much. The day, uh, makes the day really interesting because it oh, might I'm be. I'm sure. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, just send me everything and I'll have it all in the show notes so people will be able to contact you and any of the articles you want people to read. Yeah. Just yeah. send it all to me. I'll put it in the show notes, but Craig, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You're and, welcome. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Yeah.